So we're going to talk a little bit about wildlife predators and management decisions. So if you can just memorize this flow chart really quick, it'll be on the quiz when we get done. Um, and we're going to spend the next two hours right here on this flow chart. Or not. No? No. Okay, yeah, let's not do that. But this came out of a really nice publication. came out, oh, about five years ago now. And it does. It goes through all the important things you need to think about if you're contemplating doing any sort of predator management to help support your wildlife management activities. It's not something you should just leap into what have, without having thought through the process a little bit first. So everybody's got this, you know, you took notes, it's all written down now, right? So we can skip that one. It's in the handout anyway. <clears throat> but nobody goes into that kind of detail before they get involved in this stuff. Okay, well, before we get too far down the road, thinking about predator management, we better figure out first what the heck is a predator, right? Everybody already knows, right? We all know what a predator is, right? Okay. Defined as individuals of one species eating living individuals of another species. That's pretty simple. You've not seen like Wild Kingdom or National Geographic or something you know, where a lion eats somebody. I mean, that's predation. Okay. Well, what about that guy down there? Anybody recognize that? Got to take somebody older than me, probably. The screw worm fly. Oh. Remember screw worm flies? Used to be a huge issue in Texas and much of the southern United States. Big problem in the livestock industry. In fact, for a long time, this was probably one of the controlling factors from white-tailed deer populations in Texas. And then we got rid of them. Anybody know anything about screw worm flies? Yeah. Apple mission. Yeah, okay. What, what do they do? They only breed once. Only breed once. They lay their larva on a large animal. It burrows through the skin into the meat. So that larvae is consuming the flesh of another species. Is the screw worm a predator? Yes. By this definition, it is, right? He's not killing and consuming another species, but he's consuming an individual of another species. We don't normally think about predation quite that way, right? So we'll fade that one out. We'll fade these guys in. What are, what are those guys? Turkeys? Are turkeys predators? What do turkeys eat? Yeah, for the first four to six weeks of their life, that's about all they eat is insects and other invertebrates. So they're consuming lots of individuals of other species. Are they predators? Yeah. Do we normally think of turkeys as being predators? No. When we start talking about predator management, are these the guys we're usually concerned with? No, usually not. So we've got a definition, and then we've got another definition of the ones we're worried about. There we go. So here's the usual cast of suspicious characters in the state of Texas. Who's missing? If you study the history of wildlife conflicts or predation problems or whatever you want to title them here in Texas, we've got quite a history here in the state. There's a couple of notable individuals missing from this slide. We used to have grizzly bears in Texas. We got rid of them. We used to have jaguars in Texas. We got rid of them. We used to have gray wolf in Texas. We got rid of them. We used to have red wolf in Texas. We get rid of them too. We did a pretty darn good job of getting rid of black bears and mountain lions. Both of them are trying to make a comeback in certain parts of the state. So this is this is the cast of the remaining host. Well, not quite remaining host because that guy shouldn't be up there. Okay. So we started out with a really large suite of predators in the state. We brought livestock in with us. We said, you know what? There's competition for the livestock, and we don't like it. So that's where we started framing our thinking about predators and predator management. So they're killing and consuming our livestock. Not good. So we had a problem with those guys, and we started taking care of the problem. But we didn't have that flow chart to work with, so there's some decisions made that might have been a little hasty. 
So again, we, we've already started down this road a little bit. What do predators eat? Somebody else, right? Okay. But which somebody else? Do we eat the adults of some other species? Sometimes. I mean, what's the classic picture of predation? Who do they take? The weak and the infirm, the very young and the very old. Is that the truth? Sometimes. <laughs> it helps if you know who you're dealing with. These guys right here. How do mountain lions hunt? Do they chase down their prey? Not if they can help it. They're an ambush predator. So I'm going to hide up here on the rocks, and I'm going to wait for somebody to walk below my rock, and then I'm going to leap on them, and I'm going to kill them. They're an ambush predator. Are they ambushing little, small, helpless critters that go wandering by? No, because usually they come with somebody else. They're looking for one individual, a single individual. So in the case of mountain lions, quite typically we see these guys lying in wait for an adult deer or something of that matter. Usually a buck, because the bucks are out there wandering around by themselves more often than the other members of the population. So, do predators eat adults? Well, yes, sometimes they do. Again, not normally the way we think about this stuff. Do they eat young animals? Yeah, usually this is the case. Particularly if you have a predator who hunts alone, Again, puts a premium on that small, weak, and helpless thing. So if you're a coyote, are you going to go out and pull down a bull elk? Uh, no, probably not. If you're a pack of coyotes, are you going to go out and pull down a bull elk? Well, that's a possibility. Coyotes in Yellowstone National Park have actually gotten pretty good at attacking elk. We don't get much practice doing that here in Texas. But if you're a coyote by yourself, who are you going to get? Preferably somebody smaller and weaker than yourself. So then it usually means young animals. That kind of carries over into some of these other ones. Do they get the large ones or do they go for the smaller ones? Now what's large and what's small? I mean, it's large and small compared to the predator, right? And aside from things that really mess up the whole works, like the screw worm fly that takes on something much larger than itself and only eats a small part, most of them, again, if you're hunting by yourself, you're not killing something a whole lot bigger than yourself. Typically smaller and weaker. If you're hunting groups, then okay, we'll take just about anybody. And it carries over into smaller. And we'll go down to the last couple here. Do we tag singles or do we take groups? Normally when we think of predators, it's, it's one, right? We kill one, we eat that one, we may eat on that one for a week, and then we'll go get another one. Occasionally, it's just occasionally. We find predators that just, for whatever reason, probably because they're now dealing with something relatively weak and harmless like domestic livestock, and throw in stupid on top of that, like sheep, uh, and occasionally you get something like a mountain lion that'll get into a pen full of sheep and just kill five or six of them. Drag one off, but normally we're killing one. It's only in select circumstances like stupid domestic livestock that we see that other behavior. Normal. So let's get over it. So what impact do predators have on their prey populations? Again, we're, we're gonna, we'll put livestock aside for now. Let's just deal with natural populations of animals. The problem is, this is like everything else we do in wildlife. How many folks own a place? How many folks can tell me how many deer you have on your place? Yeah, I can't tell you either. I can come out and do a survey at your place and I can give you an estimate of how many deer are on your place. <coughs> but I can't tell you how many deer are on your place, right? Well, same thing, when you're trying to assess the impact of predation on prey populations, we're not certain how many were in the prey population before the predator got there. So if the predator takes out a couple, can we tell that anything happened? Usually not. It takes a long time, lots of numbers, lots of samples from different places to try to piece the, the whole thing together. Let's say if it were easy, we'd already know the answer. We're, we're still trying to come up with some of the answers. So let's break it down into the simple stuff. This is where we normally see the direct impact. 
is adult and juvenile mortality. Somebody died. We found evidence that somebody died. Pretty direct evidence of predation. Okay? We know they're eating something. So this is the direct part. This is what we can see. This part may actually be more important to the prey population, but we can't see it. There's a cost of vigilance. All of this running around with your ears perked up, blowing and stomping and all that other stuff that silly critters out there in the wild are doing when they're alarmed, it uses up energy that you could have used for something else. It changes the way they use habitat. If you're stuck out in the middle of an open field, you're a whole lot easier to find. If you're seeing a lot of predators, you're going to avoid those open areas where you are easily found. And that frequently leads over into nutritional impacts. Take a white-tailed deer doe living in South Texas. I still have this debate with some of my former colleagues at Parks and Wildlife. And we got the hill country deer population, which is booming. And we'll talk a little bit why later on. And then we have the South Texas population Always seems to be, yeah, you know, kind of, it rocks along a little bit, but it's not booming, it's not going away, it's just there. And everybody just says, well, there must be all those coyotes in South Texas. They're what control the population in South Texas. You can think about this. Those does see coyotes just about every day. When they have fawns, and that's, that's her whole goal in life, right? I have to live long enough for me and my fawn to survive. I want this fawn to join the adult population. That's why I'm here. So I'm going to choose habitat based on how many predators I've seen lately. If I don't see many, then I can go camp out in the middle of an open field and eat forbs all day long because that's what I want to eat. Forbs are more nutritious, they're easier for me to process, and I can cram in a whole bunch of them. That allows me to make more milk, and my fawn will grow faster and be big and healthy and strong. I see coyotes every day. I can't do that. I have to go hide in the thick stuff somewhere. And since I got this little bitty guy following me around and he doesn't go very far, I can't walk very far to get something to eat. So I'm not going to that big open field where I can find all those juicy forbs that I want to eat. I have to hide here in the thicket and eat a lot of brush, which doesn't give me near the nutrients I need, and I don't make as much milk as I'd like to, and the poor little fawn doesn't get as much milk as he'd like to have, and he doesn't grow very fast, and some of them succumb to nutritional deficiencies and get scavenged by coyotes. And we say, ah, the coyote killed that fawn. <clears throat> Did it? Hmm. So here's, here's the easy answer, right? If everybody familiar with the concept of K or carrying capacity? We, we think that there's something in the environment called the carrying capacity. You put this many critters out there, and the habitat will support them. You go above this number, and we start degrading the habitat. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what we're shooting at. So some folks have suggested that when the population we're concerned with, we'll call it deer, is below K, we should be out there controlling predators. If the population of deer is above K, then maybe we need to airdrop some predators to let them take care of the problem. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not quite that simple. I guarantee you it's not that simple. Otherwise, we'd be done talking already. Can predator control benefit wildlife populations? Again, this is, <laughs> we can't count them to begin with. So coming up with the answer to this question is really tough. We've had several really good literature reviews done in the last 50, 60 years. People have looked at this stuff because the question's been on our mind for a couple hundred years now. And you look at the literature reviews and you say, well, it's kind of a mixed, mixed bag here. Finally looked at 45 studies and in 27 of them, there was no indication that predators were limiting the wildlife population. So 27 out of 45, yeah, it doesn't look like anything's happening. What's that leave? Leave another 18? Is that right? Yeah, another 18 studies where we think they were having an impact. Hmm. So we get 50% more studies saying there is no impact and there is some impact. Yikes. And then if you get a little more specific, you look just at breeding bird populations. There's pretty much a consensus in the literature that, for the most part, predator removal does not reduce, or reliably reduce, the losses of those birds or increase their population. There are other things controlling the population than just predation. Yikes. <laughs> so why is this so confusing? What else is going on out there that makes it so difficult to isolate what's happening? I mean, 
It's a pretty simple act. Somebody killed somebody and ate them. Well, <laughs> the whole laundry list here. I'm going to throw a laundry list at you off and after the evening. And we'll just talk about a few of them. Habitat heterogeneity. What does that mean? Normally, habitats are pretty diverse. We got trees, we got shrubs, we got grasses, we got forbs. Some of them are in clumps, some of them are pretty evenly distributed. Lots of different species normally involved. We, people, have a habit of simplifying habitats. We do things like make orchards and plantations and farms where you know we've eliminated all the competition. We're trying to get down to just the one we're trying to create. That's what we want. We want a cornfield. It's 2,000 acres of corn. That's a pretty homogeneous environment. Same thing, you start talking about cattle grazing in a grassland habitat, habitat general, heterogeneity tends to decline because they take out the species they really like and you start ending up with something that looks a lot like your lawn with just a few tufts of plants out there that the grazing animals didn't want. So again, if we go back to something like a quail hen or a turkey hen, you're trying to find a place to hide at nest. You get a thousand acre field that's got four, four little clumps of grass sticking up out there in the middle of it. Now you're a nest predator trying to figure out where they hid the nest. Is this hard? Nope. Check those four clumps, you're probably going to find it, right? In a more heterogeneous environment, where we got all these clumps and shrubs and cactus and everything else out there, there's lots of places you can hide something small like a nest. So you simplify the habitat, you make life easier for the predator. Free refugia, medicine, ha, Synchrony of birthing season and aggregation of birthing. Again, this is one of those things where you got to wonder what we were thinking. With livestock production systems, this is normally what we aim for. We try to synchronize the birthing process in our cattle and our sheep and our goats and our horses and everybody else because that makes our management simpler. I only have to worry about being out there to help with the calving for a month. It's not going on you know, six months out of the year. I want to get it right here. Then when it comes time to ship them, I only need to pull the truck in once to load up all the calves and haul them off to market. Well, that's the way we like it. That's the way predators like it too, because if they know, holy cow, in June, there's gonna be 250 calves hit the ground. They're gonna lay there and they're not gonna be able to move or do nothing. All you gotta do is walk out and eat them. How good is life? Okay, and then of course, some predators have other nasty habits. They don't care whether it's actually the a live born critter or a dead born critter or the afterbirth that came with the critter, hey, it's all dinner one way or the other, right? If it's a predictable and abundant resource, predators will be there. Okay, shift again to something like white tailed deer. We think that normally in a really good year, it tends to compress the breeding cycle. Everybody goes into all the does start cycling at about the same time. So you have a fairly, fairly small birthing period later on in the summer. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? Because if you're putting all of them out there at the same time, aren't you just attracting the predators to the event? Mm. But again, wildlife don't act like livestock. They don't aggregate when they do that. In fact, most of them wander off to be by themselves when they do that. So we're making, you know, they're going to have to search for them. In most years, you know, even if it is a really good year, the any region in Texas, from first birth to last birth is still going to be a couple of months. So it's not predictable and it's not easy to find, so it doesn't seem near as abundant, but you do give the predators more time to learn. Yeah, that's kind of a tough, tough one there. Uh, let's see. Oh boy. Richard, you're going to cover compensatory mortality for me later? No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time tonight to get through that one. We're just going to skip right over that one. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I forgot. Yeah, I like that. Uh-oh, it says I was going to talk about that one. <clears throat> Dang it. At some point, I thought this was important. I'm just not really sure how to explain it. Everybody understands the, the concept of compensating for something, right? Well, if you lose some over here, you make up for it over there. Okay, well, we have this concept of compensatory mortality, which means if you lose some at certain parts of the year, you can make up for it later. 
in part, you start looking at these wildlife populations. You know, if you lose part of the population before you get to the breeding season, that means there's less competition for food. So everybody should go into the breeding season in better condition, and therefore you have larger litters or whelks or sparrows or whatever the case might be. So you can partially make up for that later. Well, that may be part of what's going on with wildlife populations too, is if the predators take off a few individuals from the population before you get to the breeding season, again, less competition for food amongst the, the wildlife population we're concerned with. There's more food for everybody. They're in good shape when breeding season comes. Should be good cover for everybody when the young hit the ground, and life appears to be good. So throw all this into the hopper, turn it a few times, and is it any surprise that when you pull something out, you're not too sure what you're gonna get? Right? Lots of different things could happen. <clears throat> if that weren't bad enough, time can also make a difference. Again, it's just before the breeding season, after the breeding season, before we hit K, after we hit K, whatever the case might be. So again, we're, we're going to assume, since a lot of our wildlife populations of concern are herbivores, that there's some kind of vegetative carrying capacity. There's only so much food out there to eat. Okay, so if we let the population go unrestrained, it will grow to the point where they start running out of things to eat, and then the population will come back down. That's what we think normally happens. That's not always quite that cut and dry either. But if you look at this natural cycle, and this happens for all kinds of things like moose and deer and rabbits and rats and lemmings and all kinds of crazy things. Is there a point in this cycle where we would expect predator control to benefit the wildlife species? We look over here, this is, let me just say this is deer. This is our deer population building up. If you remove predators at this point in time, what happens to the deer population? It goes up even faster, right? The faster it goes up, the greater the edge is going to overshoot this up here. So if your deer population builds up slowly, it'll probably level out just about the time it hits the carrying capacity, in theory. So is this really what we want to do for predator management? Is help the deer population shoot up quick and shoot right past the carrying capacity? It's not going to do the habitat any good in the long term. If you're going to end up with deer populations up here somewhere, they're going to be eating themselves out of house and home. So when they do crash, they're probably going to crash all the way down into here somewhere. Okay, what about the other side of that? Well, you can say that this is the effect that we have by removing some of the population here is we artificially reduced the population and we moved K down, well, K hasn't moved, but this is where the population can be. This is the vegetative carrying capacity. So if we keep the population below the vegetative carrying capacity, we're not hurting the habitat. On the other side of that, normally, you know, you get a year with some good rains, you start to produce lots of vegetation, Wildlife species do fairly good. They start to reproduce. Their populations start building up. Predator populations tend to lag behind them by a year or two. So that's part of the reason we see this flattening up here. These guys are exploding so fast down here that the predators couldn't keep up with them if they wanted to. Once they get up here and they start heading down, well, guess what? The predator populations are still going this way. And they've already learned to take advantage of this deer population or moose population or whoever's population it is. <coughs> So we get past the peak, things start heading downhill, and predators are pushing the population downhill faster. So we think it's possible that predator management at this point will help reduce the depth of this valley. There's probably another line here. Yep, how about that? We might be able to stop at the population here instead of crashing all the way down to here. Problem with this, in the long term, possibly, is it allows this next up cycle to start sooner. So the habitat didn't get as long to recover from here to the next peak as it would have otherwise. Everybody getting confused now? I mean, this, this is one we would expect it, predator management to have the most beneficial effect on the prey population. That's the easy answer. Again, part of what makes this so confusing is it's tough to say that predators are what's limiting the population. Most often there are several things that are limiting prey survival or wildlife populations. 
So the tough part is trying to figure out when is it the predator, when is it something else. The other part of this problem is when you don't get the predators who are actually doing the deed, you're not doing yourself any good. What we've learned from about a century's worth of, of coyote control now is that there are certain individuals in the, the coyote population who do most of the damage. They tend to be the resident coyotes because they're the ones that are reproducing. And when you get pups in the den, you need food for the pups in the den. So you've got to go out and kill somebody so you can drag it back and feed the pups in the den. Transient pup, uh, coyotes, who make up a really good chunk of the population, <coughs> tend not to be that bad. They're the guys that are out there, you know, they're afraid to stay in any one spot for long because somebody's going to run them off. So they're just kind of running through the landscape, harvesting whatever they can get really quick. So a lot of it ends up being fruits and berries and nuts and mice and whatever else they can grab as they're running through. They aren't normally the ones we see taking larger prey. So if you're taking out the transient coyotes, which are the easier ones to trap mostly because they don't know their, their home range as well as the other guys do, you're not solving the problem. The resident coyotes are still causing you problems. Then there's this whole, <laughs> we, we've tried to establish that there, there may be a vegetative carrying capacity. You know, there's only so much food out there. This is how much we could possibly support if everybody was getting their share to eat. Well, there may be some point below that where we're getting some other products from the landscape that we'd like to see. So it's been suggested that you know for things like deer, at about 20% of K, which is a long ways from saturated population, you get optimal biodiversity in the ecosystem. Again, we know above K the deer are eating themselves and several other critters out of house and home. But well below K, certain things begin disappearing from the habitat. So at 20% of K, we get optimal biodiversity. <coughs> Natural forest rejuvenation, anything above 20 to 40% of K, you begin to see a problem. Highest deer yield, usually right around 50% of K. If you know anything about that logistic growth curve, we'll call it a flexion point right there in the middle. That's where we tend to get optimal production for the population. Above 60% of K, body condition begins to decline. We're competing for food. It's no longer easy to just go out and grab everything you need. There's going to be a host of different effects. We have a whole suite of species of plants in the Texas Hill Country that are no longer effectively reproducing. There are several oak species that are disappearing because they're not reproducing. There are a whole bunch of other plants that normally are, are understory plants. The deer are eating them off faster, they're never growing back. Does that kind of reflect on what I just told you? It should, right? There are other products in the environment. We get optimal biodiversity at 20% of K. We get maximum deer productivity at 50% of K, but if we let the deer population run all the way up to K, we're, there's a trade-off there somewhere. Somebody's got to pay that price. So we said that there may be times and places where predator management can benefit wildlife species. Are there times where predator control doesn't help? Uh, and again, we've got to go back to the direct and indirect effects here. Uh, Keystone role in the ecosystem. This is um, everybody remember those those nice arches that the Romans built to support their aqueducts. Everybody remember that stuff? <laughs> you start carving those big rocks and piling them up on top of each other like that, trying to get them to lean to the middle. That one at the very top that's kind of shaped like the state of Pennsylvania. That's the Keystone. That's what we call Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. Ooh, well, we're just covering all kinds of topics here, right? <clears throat> okay, so predators play a keystone role in the ecosystem. They're the important guys up here that are kind of holding the whole arch together. You pull them out, and both sides of the arch tend to fall in. So you take all the predators out of the ecosystem, the ecosystem just tends to go nuts. Things start disappearing left and right. So is it possible that we could have a detrimental effect? Well. 
Removal of predators can have cascading detrimental effects at each trophic level. There's a mouthful. One of my colleagues is fond of saying, you're, you're free to choose your actions, but not the consequences. Okay. We're free to decide whether or not to go out there and manage predator populations. But we don't have much to say with what happens after that. Hang on here, because we're going to try to build a little case study for it. Again, I say much above 60% of pain, we begin to see all kinds of things start to happen. Body weights begin to decline, disease resistance goes down, reproductive rates tend to go down. <clears throat> this one shows up fairly early and continues through the whole thing. These guys, they fall off really fast at the beginning and then they just kind of hold on down here. So what's that mean? What, what, how do you see that effect? We have a really good example here in Texas. If you look at size of white-tailed deer bucks in particular, and we know that silly things like Allen's rule and Bergman's rule mean that animals that live way up north are bigger than the ones that live way down south. Right? But even if you just look at deer within the state of Texas, we can compare the ones from, say, oh, the post oak savanna and the piney woods. They're not very big, but they're here. Guess who's here at the bottom of the curve? Texas hill country deer are the smallest deer in the state. In fact, they're the smallest deer in the U.S. other than the key deer in South Florida. But we have archaeological records to suggest that wasn't always the case. If you start looking at some of the bones that have been found in some of the Indian middens and stuff from a few hundred years ago, deer in the Edwards Plateau evidently were a little bit bigger than what they are today. Why did they end up small? Probably because the population got large. Competition for those food resources. This is the other big bugaboo we see. Again, we're not free to choose the consequences. We can remove grizzly bears, we can remove gray wolf, we can remove red wolf. Things happen after that. Larger predators suppress smaller predators. So we get rid of the wolves, we end up with a whole bunch of coyotes. If you get rid of coyotes, you end up with a whole lot of foxes, coons, and skunks. I already talked a little bit about resident versus transient predators and habitat use. Here's the other thing that happens. I said, we'll, we'll ignore the wolves and the grizzly bears and all that stuff because it happened so long ago we don't remember anymore. To take coyotes out of the system, not only do we end up with more foxes, coons, and skunks, but it totally changes the way they use the world. When coyotes are out there on the landscape, they tend to dominate the upland sites, the open grassy stuff. They catch a coon out in the middle of the open grassy stuff, they kill the coon. So coons say, oh, okay, you guys can have the uplands, we'll stay down here in the creeks. And we'll climb the trees and we'll catch crayfish and all that stuff. Take coyotes out of the picture, now where do you find coons? Everywhere. Why is that a problem? Well, again, let's think about things like that quail hen and that turkey hen who are building a nest on the ground. Who's a better nest predator, a coyote or a coon? So we have unintended consequences there. Talk about those, talk about those, talk about that. In case you don't believe me, nice little study down a little farther west than Texas. Bless you, sir. A few years back, they said, okay, let's take two study sites. We'll take some measurements on how many coyotes and small predators there are on the two sites. Then we'll remove coyotes from one of them right here in the winter of 89 and we'll see what happens to the small predator population. Lo and behold, the little guys just exploded after they removed the coyotes. On the other side of life, <coughs> if anything, they went down. So, did the coyotes have a controlling influence over the number of smaller mammalian predators? Yes, they clearly did. Large-scale experiments. Those of you not familiar with the Edwards Plateau experiment, boy, this is an amazing one. By 1950, we had almost 24 million acres, 29 counties in the central part of the state that were declared coyote free. Okay? We've become so good at removing coyotes from those properties. I won't say they were gone, but just the numbers were so low, nobody was complaining anymore. You know, we can't just credit the, the government trappers for doing all of that, it's because people, you know, prior to the 1950s, 
people who lived out there in the landscape, that's where you made your living. Everybody was raising livestock, everybody was raising crops, everybody had something against coyotes. Everybody worked together and said, okay, on Saturday we're going to meet over at Jonesy's place. We're going to line up, we're going to walk the pastures. If we find a coyote, we're going to kill it. That's how you get rid of coyotes on 24 million acres. Okay? That was in 1950. Okay, well, we can't go all the way back to 1950 and look at the numbers of smaller mammalian predators. We don't have that data set. However, Parks and Wildlife has an interesting data set from 1978 to 2003 on small mammalian predators seen on spotlight counts. This is the location map showing where they were doing all of those spotlight counts in that same region that was once declared coyote free. Here's what the trends for raccoons and gray fox look like in those regions. Are they going up or down or staying the same? Clearly going up, right? The surprising part of that is, well, okay, this, this may be the upshot. 1930s, yeah, we had some pretty significant quail populations in the Texas Hill Country. How many of you guys got quail in your place now? Oh, good, I'm glad there's some of you that do. There ought to be a bunch more, but there are not. Because we did such a wonderful job of getting rid of the coyotes, we did a wonderful job of growing some of those other guys. So we shifted the balance a little bit in terms of the smaller predators, and they kind of made life tough for those guys. Here's the surprising part to me. Again, by 1950, we said, well, we got no coyotes on those 24 million acres. Even by 1978, when the Parks and Wildlife data set started, coyotes had made a little bit of a comeback, not a huge one. By 2003, Almost 3,300 coyotes removed from that region. So there were a fair number of coyotes out there. And across that whole period, we saw increases in the populations of fox and coon. But we hadn't reached that tipping point yet. How many coyotes is it going to take before we reverse that trend? I don't know. But it sure looks to me like we're headed in that direction. So again, we had that nice flow chart on the first screen, you know, and all of the things we needed to worry about, all the decisions we needed to make if we were going to do this the smart way. Let's talk about why we don't do that. <laughs> Are the game numbers at carrying capacity, or is there room for more game? If there is room for more game, how much more room? How many more animals do you think you could put out there? And if we're convinced that the habitat will support more, why aren't they there now? Is it just predators or is there something else going on? In most cases, we don't know. <clears throat> how many of you guys have a garden? You keep real close track of how much money you spend producing all the crops out of your garden every year? Nobody wants to know that, right? Yeah. You know, your, your labor and the seed and all the water and the fertilizer and the weeding and everything else. You say, man, I'm getting all these vegetables for free. Yeah. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> garden economics. We don't want to know how much it costs to do that. We just know we like fresh vegetables from the garden. Predator controls kind of the same way. We don't really want to know how much it costs to do it. It just feels right when we do it. Okay? But if you're going to do it the smart way, is it feasible? Can you possibly remove enough predators to do any good? And I'm going to tell you in a minute, this is the wrong measure. Not how many you remove that really counts. How do we decide when we've reached that point? How many of you guys are monitoring your predator populations? Nope, nobody else does either. So how do you know when you're done controlling the population? We don't know. Benefit cost, you can see, if we didn't take <coughs> account of the cost up here, then it's really tough to figure out what the benefit cost ratio is down here. Okay. I spent $700 to a predator control last year. What'd you get for it? I don't know. <laughs> Did you get one more deer, two more deer, a dozen more deer? I don't know. Alternatives to control. Before expensive predator control programs are launched, the alternatives to control should be considered. One of those should be, what happens if you do nothing? 
the do-nothing alternative. Anybody in here ever done any NEPA paperwork? National Environmental Protection Act? That, that's always one of the alternatives. The do-nothing alternative. What happens if we don't do anything? We don't spend a lot of money, but we don't solve a lot of problems either. So if you start thinking about this stuff, I mean, if you're spending $7,000 a year doing predator control and you can't tell whether or not you're getting any benefit out of it, how long do you keep hitting your thumb with a hammer before you say, you know what, I should probably stop hitting my thumb with a hammer. <laughs> it's not how many you take off that counts. It's how many you leave out there. And which ones did you leave? Again, in coyotes, we know there's a big difference between the resident and the transients. Some of the other populations, we still don't know. But we took off 1,700 feral hogs. Good for you. I'm really proud of you. How many did you leave behind? 4,400. Uh-oh. Uh, guess how many are going to be next year? 100,000. <laughs> so it's not how many you took off, it's how many you left behind that really makes the difference. If we're talking about deer and trying to do predator management to improve deer production, the only thing that we think we have proven to be effective, I say we think we have proven to be effective, is to remove them just before the fawning period. This is when the coyotes are having their young. And it's those nasty old resident coyotes. You got pups in the den, you got to feed the pups in the pen. Get rid of the coyotes before you have pups in the den, they won't be tempted to go out there and kill the fawns, or at least not as tempted to go out there and kill the fawns. How much time, money, and effort does that take? We don't want to know. I can only think of, of two published studies where it's actually worked. One of them involved an awful lot of helicopter time with people shooting coyotes out of a helicopter with a shotgun. The other one, I don't remember how they did it, but you know, a couple of published studies pretty conclusively showed that removing coyotes at the right time of year did have an impact on deer production. Was it worth it? We don't know. We're up against some smart critters, in case you haven't figured this one out yet. We got exotics and other stuff. We have high fence popping up like mushrooms across the countryside. That fact has not been lost on coyotes. Particularly if you put a bunch of exotics, like black buck, in a pasture that's high fence, put a pair of coyotes in there, first thing they do is they run a bunch of black buck down into a corner. Where the black buck gonna go? They're not going anywhere. <laughs> so the coyotes have learned to use our tools against us. Yikes. What do you do about them? Um, predation becomes more pronounced as pasture size decreases. Again, it applies mostly to livestock, but also to certain wildlife species, particularly the exotics that we have fenced in. So not going anywhere. Again, it's that simplifying habitat thing. I don't have to search 2,000 acres to find one because they're in this 50 acre pen. Life is sweet. Our current best thinking, an integrated wildlife damage management plan. I mean, you guys are involved in controlling mesquite or prickly pear or something else on the place. Did you, did you go out and do it once? No. You can go out and do it once, and then go back five years later and do it again, go back five years later and do it again. It's a continual effort to control those populations. Same thing with predators. If you really intend to control their populations, it has to be a continual effort, and you have to use every tool at your disposal, whether it's trapping, snaring, aerial gunning, denning, toxicants, whatever you've got. If you need more details on how to do all of that, then I would suggest you contact your local wildlife services representative. Or you can go to YouTube and see some of them because I've been doing a whole bunch of this stuff with feral hogs and we got corral traps and snaring and all that stuff up on the YouTube site. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum. Sound animal husbandry practices. Again, with domestic livestock, we have certain things we can do. When we know calving season is coming, or kidding season, or lambing season, whatever the case might be, Move them into a pasture right behind the house. So you can go out there and check on them every day. You can go out there in the middle of the night and check on them. 
pretty tough to do that with most wildlife species. They're out there somewhere doing something, right? You can't move them anywhere. You can't tell them where or when to do nothing. So the sound management practices can be tough to come by. Fencing and habitat enhancement can help. Habitat enhancement, again, that simplified habitat, no place to hide. Diverse habitats, more places to hide, more places to produce buffer species that some of these guys might be interested in eating instead of you. <clears throat> Fencing to control predators, is that possible? Well, I got a whole section in here just in case Richard didn't show up. We got a whole other hour we can talk about fencing for predator management, but we won't do that one. Suffice it to say there have been lots of attempts to create something that looks like a predator-proof fence. My first suggestion to most folks is it's, it's very, very difficult to do that. What you're better off doing is using the fence to steer the predators to someplace else. First some places, send them on down the road to the neighbor's place, right? Let him deal with them. Or send the predators just a little ways down the fence line where you have the surprise waiting for them. Make an opening in the fence that they can readily go through and then have a trap waiting for them on the other side. So we can use fences to help direct predators to where we can deal with them. Very difficult to use fences to exclude them. There is one, and again, since we're not doing that program, you won't get to see the video. Too bad. <laughs> Again, the integrated wildlife damage management plan is our current best thinking. Implementing one is extremely difficult. Remember when I talked about that coyote free zone in the central part of the state? Yes, the government trappers did a great job, but it was because all of the landowners in that area cooperated with each other to finish the job. We had a single voting block out there. They all said, oh, coyote's gone. We don't have that cohesive train of thought anymore. We have some people say, oh, no, no, leave them alone. And then we have certain species that, you know, some people like to see bobcats, some people like to see coyotes, some people like to see feral hogs, for some reason. Um, so it doesn't do you much good, you know, you get 10,000 acres and eight out of 10 landowners say, yeah, yeah, let's control those predators. And the two guys in the middle say, oh, nope, we're not doing that. Where are they gonna live? Or they got to come back from each time, right? So we have no problems trying to accomplish that stuff anymore. Uh, you know, managing quail in 400 acres might be possible. Managing coyotes in 400 acres, probably not going to happen. Get rid of them on your 400 acres. They're coming in from someplace around the outside. Uh, again, unless we all agree on what the goal is, it's really, really tough to get there. And this kind of rolls in there with that. Public opinion is less supportive of predator control for game management than it is for protection of livestock or a rare or threatened species. Everybody will rally and say, yeah, 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 we got to protect the poor golden sheep warbler or whatever the case might be. So let's control the predators that are hurting them and, and life will be good. Or, you know, this poor guy <laughs> is just trying to make a living off his goats and you know, the mountain lions and the coyotes are killing all of his kids and he's just going broke, so yeah, we'll let him do some predator management on his place. When you want to tell them, no, I just want to grow more deer so I can shoot more deer, they tend not to agree with that near as much. Okay? So we don't always get the same level of support from the public. Just, you know, so maybe we need a more natural form of predator management. Something that nobody would argue with, right? So we just need more mules like this guy. That's, that's a mountain lion in case you can't tell. He's just whipping that thing around, stomping on it. Uh, any of you guys get this in your email about, oh gosh, four or five years ago? Yeah, the, the, the claim that went with it was that this thing just ran out there and grabbed this mountain lion and just started whooping on it. Man, that'd be fantastic. The counter claim was what, no, actually the mountain lion was already dead and the mule got there. He just really took it out on it. <laughs> okay. And then, real quick, in the next five minutes, again, because we need to decide who it is that we're trying to control. We're trying to figure out, you know, we, we have a general idea of what predators are, what impacts they're having on the population, but how do we know who done the deed? So I should back up there. CSI fans? Are they CSI fans? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to the CSI fans then. 
<clears throat> just realize that there's a whole host of things that kills critters, right? And there's some of them listed on the page there. And here's a laundry list for you. Again, I told you I'd give you more laundry lists. Starvation, parasites, diseases, pregnancy, and other metabolic diseases. It's tough to think of pregnancy as a metabolic disease. It certainly has some interesting effects, though. Uh, hardware disease, mostly in livestock because they eat things that they were never supposed to eat. Bits of wire and all that other stuff. Uh, bloat because they ate something they weren't supposed to eat. Suffocation, poisoning, lightning strikes, snake bites, trauma. All kinds of things can kill critters. Now, again, I kind of mentioned my background rather briefly. At several different stages in my career, people have mentioned this. Common things occur commonly. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> and Richard will readily agree with this one. If you're out there and you find some tracks on the ground, you don't want to immediately leap to the most exotic species that could possibly have created those tracks. So, What's common in the area that could have created these tracks? Common things occur common. If you know that a predator species is present in the area where you live, okay, they're on the list of suspects. If you know what their habitats and signs look like, okay, I, can, I don't have any habitat for mountain lions, it's probably not mountain lions. If you know your neighbors have had a problem with a particular species of predator, say, hey, if it happened next door, it could happen here. Common things occur commonly. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <laughs> there's all kinds of things that complicate this picture too. Uh, predators frequently feed on carrion and other predators kill. So just because you see somebody feeding on a carcass doesn't mean they kill the animal. Several species may feed on the same carcass. The most conclusive evidence of predation is observation of the event. Ready? How many of you guys got trail cameras? How many get trail cameras? Okay, got one, two, okay. This is from a graduate study looking at turkey nest survival in the Texas Hill Country. Put trail cameras up on several turkey nests to see what happened to the nest. The interesting thing is here, 19th of May, 2006 at 10, 12 p.m., a raccoon is in here stealing an egg. 10.42, a fox is in here at the same nest stealing an egg. At 11.28, on the same day, here's a skunk right in the same nest. Two days later, here's the pigs cleaning up what's left. Without the camera, you go to this nest at the end of the string of events, who did the deed? <laughs> pigs! Pigs tore up this nest! Wrong! Unless you see the event, you don't know what happened. What killed this sheep? Probably that coyote attached to his muzzle, right? <laughs> Again, most of us, because we've become a little divorced from this whole process of producing livestock and stuff off the land, have gotten kind of out of touch with some of these things. We don't have the training, the experience. We may be able to pay attention to the details, but we don't necessarily know how to put all those pieces together. This one usually throws most people for a loop. I tell them, you know, locate all three sites involved. Where's the attack site? Where's the kill site? Where's the feeding site? What do you mean, those are all different? Yeah, they may very well be all different places. If you can find all three, it may tell you something about what happened. If you don't find all three, then part of the puzzle's missing. You can't find those, well, <laughs> this is the one I always dealt with back in the days when I worked in public hunting areas. The guys go out there and they shoot something, and then they come back and say, well, I can't find it, can you come help me find it? And you go out there and you start looking, and you know, there are tracks all over whatever trail was there to begin with. They say, well, I know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> After that, it's going to get a lot tougher. So, muck up all the evidence right away. If you can't find these sites, go look at trails, fence line, creeks, water holes, and other areas to find out who might have been in the area. Again, common things occur commonly. You got coyote tracks, you got pig tracks, you got fox tracks in the area. Well, they're all suspects. If you don't find any tracks, they probably aren't out there. If you find a carcass, there's lots of things we can look at to start narrowing down the, the picture a little bit. So, again, characterize the site. Was it an attack site? Was it a kill site? Or is it a feeding site? This one, 
Anybody know what's going on here? A deer that's been partially covered up with debris. Cats do this. Big cats and little cats will do this. They like to cover things up and come back later. So this is a feeding site. Right? There, there was a bird here one time. So is that an attack site, a kill site, or a feeding site? Quite possibly all three. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, something got drug away, right? There's, there's footprints on either side of the drag mark. Cats with a fairly large prey item will grasp it with their mouth, drag the victim beneath their body while they're staggering away with it. So the victim is creating the drag mark while the predator is leaving the footprints on either side. Again, cats do that. This is somewhere between the kill site and the feeding site. So, we didn't find that stuff, we're going to go look for other evidence. So, we find tracks, we might find hair on the fence. Anybody know what kind of hair this is? Mine in a really bad day. You notice all the split ends here? <laughs> Hog hair. Hogs have really coarse hair. Lots of split ends. They're not using a lot of conditioner out there. So roll around in the mud. Not good for your hair. Maybe for the complexion, but not for the hair. Cats. If you've been out in Texas anywhere or anytime recently, you've probably seen coyote scat. Right? Scat happens. If you have a carcass, we can probably learn something by looking at the carcass. We can look at what part of the carcass was fed on first. We can look at the disposition of the carcass out there on the ground. Again, we can look at what was fed on, other physical evidence, even critters that haven't had a chance to try to get away yet. We can look at the evidence that's there and piece things together. If you're gonna get serious about this, you got a carcass, you're gonna to have to you know, take this detailed look at the outside first, and if that doesn't tell you what you need to know, then you need to start skinning these things out. But I will offer this caution first of all. If you find an otherwise healthy looking animal dead on the ground, your first suspicion ought to be disease. If it killed him, why are you messing with it? Okay? If you find one that you know, it's all bloodied up already, well, it probably wasn't a disease issue. Something happened either trauma or predation, something. Again, here, this guy started peeling things back and you can see he's got a whole bunch of individual spots marked here on the skin. You can see actual individual puncture marks and the skin there. That will tell us something. We can look at puncture marks in the meat back here. That tells us something. We got puncture marks in the angle of the jaw down here. That tells us something. This is the back of a lamb. We've got these two funny looking bruises in the middle of the back. That tells us a lot. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'll tell you in a minute. Sometimes we just have to play the match game. If you find those puncture wounds in the skin or in the meat, how far apart are they? It may help you figure out who did the deed. Mountain lion, coyote, bobcat, fox. Notice there's a significant difference between the distance between the canine teeth. Will this always answer the question? No. But if you find something that's an inch and a half apart over here, you can probably rule these guys out, right? <laughs> Keep in mind also, there's subtle differences between males and females. Males tend to be a little bigger than the females. So if you get both sexes involved, it can get a little confusing. Okay, so here's the quiz. What kind of dropping is this? What do we got in there? What does this look like? It's like a whole lot of prickly pear tunas, doesn't it? Who eats prickly pear fruits? Everybody! <laughs> <laughs> so what's that tell us? Okay, well, I'll help you out. It's a predator. What kind of predator eats prickly pear tunas? Coyotes do. Hogs do. Turkeys. Turkeys are predators too, right? They eat those things. <laughs> That's not a turkey dropping. <laughs> It'd be tough, as loose as this, is trying to figure out, is that, is that coyote or is that hog? Look for tracks around the dropping. In this case, we had coyote tracks around the dropping. So that's a coyote dropping. What's that one? What do we get in there? We get some prickly pear fruits. We got some mesquite beans. We got turkey. All kinds of mess in there. Who's eating that stuff? Who eats mesquite beans? I already told you the answer. Everybody eats mesquite beans. 
and everybody eats tunas. Narrows it right down, right? Look for tracks. We found hog tracks. Good chance this is a hog scat. Okay, we're going to tracks. Everybody recognizes that thing, right? It's a quarter, there for scale. So we know how big those tracks are. Are they huge? No. Nope, they're bigger than a quarter, but not a whole lot bigger than a quarter. Is that a dog track or a cat track? I heard cat. No, somebody shaking his head. Dog, cat, cat, dog. dog. How do we know? First thing, if you just imagine a line that goes between the outside toes, notice that this one crosses right here between the pad and the toes. Who has longer toes, cats or dogs? Dogs, generally. So the toe imprints are farther from the pad in a dog than they are in a cat. They give you this little space here. So this is a dog, it's not a cat. The other thing getting this away is, what, what, what's going on here? What are those two little impressions right there? Claw marks? Yeah, do cats walk around with their claws out all the time? No. No, you normally don't see them unless they're in pursuit of somebody. If they're in pursuit, these tracks aren't gonna be this, to, this close together. What else tips us off? If you get a really, really good track, Look at the back of the pad here. And if you got a lobe over here, you got a lobe over here, and just kind of a dish in between. Dog tracks have two lobes, cat tracks have three. Okay, so it's definitely a dog, not a cat. Domestic dog, coyote, fox, what are we talking about? Well, it's bigger than this, so it's too big to be a fox. So they either a domestic dog or a coyote. How do we tell the difference? Look at the overall shape of the track. Notice it's kind of long and lean. Instead of short and squatty. Who tends to be long and lean versus short and squatty between coyotes and dogs? Coyotes are kind of long and lean. So are their tracks. Domestic dogs, these two outside toes will generally be bigger. And you'll have almost a circular track and sometimes actually kind of wider than it is long track. Coyote track. Ruler for scale, are these big or are these small? Pretty big. What do you think we got? Cat. What tells us it's cat? First, let's draw the X. Draw the X between the outside toes. Notice it crosses in the middle of the pad. Oh, it's not a dog track, it's a cat track. The other thing that tips us off, look at the back of the pad. One, two, three lobes. It's a rare day when you get this kind of track and actually see the lobes on the back of the pad. Every once in a while, you know, just because it happens. <laughs> so it's a cat, okay. Big cat, little cat. Is that a bobcat? Is that a mountain lion? Oh, the other thing that tips us off that it's a cat. Notice the way the tracks are placed. Cats like to put their hind foot down just about in the same spot they put the front foot down. If I didn't make any noise with the front one, I won't make any noise with the back one. Dogs, because they're usually running after something, don't care about making noise. <laughs> Cats are trying to sneak up on somebody. So we're going nice and slow, one foot up, one foot down. So this is what we call direct register, when one track lays right on top of the other. The other thing here is, look at the stride from here to here. How tall is a bobcat? Not like that? You think it's going to be 12 inches from one track to the next if he's walking? Nope. <laughs> this is a big track. They're a long ways apart. So who do we think it is? No. Well, okay. Again, we should already know the answer here. We've already talked about it. It's a drag. Who did this? No. No. A cat, for sure. Right. In this case, we had the kill site right here because we had the blood. And then we drug him off. You can see some bloody footprints going off into the distance there. This one, we don't know where the attack site or the kill site was. All we know is we got this, and at the end of it, it's going to be a rainbow. Pot of gold, right? <laughs> no, not so much. Kind of a filthy, stinking mess. But anyway, yeah, some kind of cat did this. In this particular case, this was a bobcat drag over here. This was a mountain lion drag over here. 
So the other part of this picture, this is kind of disturbing to think that people did this kind of research. How long does it take a coyote to kill an adult sheep? Way back in the 50s and 60s, the guys at the National Wildlife Research Center did this stuff. You know, how long do we have to actually see the event? They're killing the sheep by suffocation. He clamps down on the throat, comes up from underneath, grabs him right here. How long does it take to suffocate a victim? Five. Five. We've seen this on TV a thousand times, right? The guy's asleep in his bed, somebody can think grabs a pillow, stuffs it down over the guy's face, holds it for about 30 seconds, he's dead. <laughs> I don't think so. 10 to 14 minutes. This guy is clamped on here for 15 minutes. What do you think that means right here? Notice the extensive bleeding. If somebody's clamped down your throat for 10 or 15 minutes while you're struggling trying to get away, you're going to bleed a lot. Notice we can actually see puncture wounds. First, first question, anybody know what kind of job this is? Yo. Cap Ryan. It's a goat job. Okay. Notable is this particular region right here. Again, knowing how coyotes attack a victim that's bigger than they are, Come up from underneath and try to clamp down on the jaw. Quite frequently, you get a canine tooth in the angle of the jaw. You clamp down hard enough and they wiggle around long enough, you're going to punch holes in the angle of the jaw. Doesn't always happen, but it happens frequently enough that you we'll pretty much break that one off. This is where life gets ugly. Natural predators that do this for a living tend to be good at killing their prey. Other critters who don't do it for a living tend not to be so good at killing prey. Does that suggest anything? Was this a good clean kill? No. no. This was an ugly mess that took a long time. Yeah, this was a pack of dogs that attacked a sheep. They didn't know what the heck they were doing. They kept getting away, so they kept grabbing a piece and pulling. We pulled off fur and we pulled off skin and eventually the poor thing died. This is an inefficient predator. It's probably a good thing since most of us have one at home, right? <laughs> First of all, anybody know what's left here? What, what is this thing? What did it start out as? No? Porcupine. Porcupine, yeah, look at all the quills here. How much of it's left? We got the neck region, we got the leg region, we got the whole body region, we got the tail over here. Somebody skinned out a porcupine. Aliens! Aliens <laughs> did, a, did an autopsy on him, right? Well, yeah, maybe not. There's only one critter we know of that does this. Anybody know? It, it's somebody that's pretty handy with their claws. Well, not quite that handy. <laughs> somebody considerably bigger than the porcupine. Yeah, mountain lions. Mountain lions have been known to do this. They'll flip these buggers over on their back and just rip them open. Some cats, in fact, appear to specialize in porcupines. Must be really good stuff. That's all I can <laughs> Never eat porcupine. <clears throat> okay. First thing we notice is the way it's lying on the ground, right? And partially covered up. Who does that? Okay. Big cat, little cat. How do we know? Big animal. We think it was a big one? Got highlighted. Yes, I did. Yeah, first thing is, we got to bring over part of it. May or may not be some evidence there. Mountain lions usually do a pretty good job of covering up the, the carcass. Bobcats can, don't always. Next one, what, what's going on right here? What, what are these little spots? Somebody roughed up the fur, right? Quite frequently, when bobcats attack, they'll grab the shoulder region to try to get a grip. But also, once it's on the ground, it's like they're trying to camouflage it or something. You know, if I ruffle up all the fur, nobody will recognize it. And third thing here, right there. 
puncture marks in the side of the neck. Mountain lions and bobcats both have a tendency on, on things they get a hold of anyway to attack either the top of the skull or the back of the neck. And this isn't a particularly large doe. If it had been a mountain lion, you'd think it would have had much difficulty getting a grip on this one. Now, sometimes bobcats have a little difficulty trying to get the back of the neck and they'll slide over to the side a little bit. So who do you think did the deed? Probably a bobcat. Okay, poor helpless critters. That's what we like to eat, right? Can't get much more poor and helpless than an egg. They're not going anywhere. They can't scream for help. But different predators do attack eggs in different fashions. So, any idea who does this kind of thing? Make sure there's a list. <laughs> could be fox. Could be. Uh, could be a skunk. Could be. Well, could be easy. In this case, it's a bobcat. Th think about cats. Cats are kind of fastidious about the way they eat, right? They don't like to get dirty. Dogs will just dive right in there. They don't care. <laughs> cats are a little fastidious about it. So we got the egg. We're just going to kind of nibble away at the outside. And then we're going to kind of lick the good stuff out of the middle without making a mess on our face. So that's what you got going on here. We're just chew off the side, and then we're going to lap out the insides. This guy, again, because coons have those wonderfully dexterous paws in the front, they open an egg the same way we do. Pick it up, crack it in half. <laughs> Gone. Makes a big difference whether it's one coon or a family of coons. If it's just one coon, you'll walk into the nest and eat all the eggs right there. If it's a family of coons, nobody wants to play nice. So you run in, you grab an egg, and you run 10 or 15 feet away so nobody steals your egg. <laughs> so you'll find eggshell evidence everywhere. Little bitty piles scattered around the nest site. I dare nobody in Texas has seen this one in a while. Okay, I bet you actually came from Tennessee, I believe it was. What happened here? What's missing? Udders. The udder. Who eats the udder and leaves everything else alone? Mm -hmm. Nobody in Texas has seen this one in a while. At least, not most parts of Texas. The other thing that kind of gives it away here, anything odd about the the way the head is lying up there? The neck is broken and the udder is missing. Put one and one together and what do we come up with? Who kills their victims by walking up to them and going, BOW! A bear. And quite frequently, they'll eat the udder first before they eat anything else. Well, this was a black bear killed by an And this one is terrible. I've tried to get a better shot of this, and it just comes out worse every time I try to do something to it. Got this nice big arrow here. Everybody sees the big arrow, right? See this leg here? See all this dark stuff here? Any idea what that is? How many of you have dogs at home? How many of you live outside of town? How many of you have ever had a dog get bit by a rattlesnake? Okay. If you look at a rattlesnake bite, this one, the bite was all the way down here by the hoof. All of this hemorrhaging here was because of the venom in the rattlesnake bite. In this particular case, it went straight up the vascular system right into the heart and boom dead had you not skinned this what would you have seen nothing <laughs> most cases when we see a dog with a rattlesnake bite what do you see swollen up huge right because it didn't kill him didn't get into the vascular system didn't go to the heart so you get localized swelling, whether it's on the leg, or whether it's on the head. I've had a couple of them, they get bit on the foreleg and the whole thing swelled up to the brisket and all bust open and drain, it was ugly. This one never had that chance. Okay, final one. You ready, Richard? Here's our little lamb again. We've got the two funny looking bruises in the middle of his back. So I'm gonna go out there and hit him with a switch. Oh. What does that? Now, if it's a mountain lion, he'd be attacking way up here in the head and the back of the neck. <coughs> this is in the middle of the back. 
Okay. Golden Eagle. Big old talons. Trying to grab this lamb right in the middle of the back. Picked him up, got a little ways, didn't get too far. Dropped him. It's not the fall of the kid, it's a sudden stop at the end, right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I said it was the last one, sorry. Uh, again, quail tend to demonstrate all kinds of different predator evidence because everything in the world kills quail. And when you're six inches tall and, you know, half of you is breast meat, everybody thinks you're a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> Two distinctive patterns. One that we refer to as the puff of feathers effect, and the other is the, oh, somebody took really nice care of business here and flipped off pieces. Puff of feathers effect is usually a mammal killing a bird. They just go grab it, shake it till it's dead, and then just eat it right there. Big puff of feathers. In this case, we got a radio transmitter left behind, and normally if you look at the antenna on it, it'll have all kinds of little zigzag on it where it got chewed on. Uh, this one where the wings have been clipped off and all the meat's been picked off the bones and everything nice and clean, this is typical of a hawk killing a quail. Gonna clip off the wings to get them out of the way, to pull off all the breast feathers, to pick the meat all nice and clean. This is what's left behind. If you have an antenna on this one, you only end up with an antenna that's got a little hook on the end because they pull the whole thing through the mouth trying to clean it off and it leaves a little hook on the end. Not much of that quail left. Most of that's radio transmitter. The other part of this is the crop. Owl. 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 Yeah. Owls tend to be the other side of the avian world here. We swallowed the whole thing whole, and then we spit out the parts we didn't want. In this case, just the transmitter and the crop. That's all we didn't want. Everything else digested. <coughs> oh, this, this is the final one. Actually, very last, very last. I'm starting to believe you. I promise. Other than the stuff I brought in case you didn't show up. <laughs> this was a lamb. What's left of the lamb? Not a whole lot. Uh, this is four quarters over here. This is hind quarters over here. This is kind of a naked rib cage here. Um, you know, ribs have all been clipped off. One thing that usually gives things away, if you find ribs that have been chewed on, coyotes just can't resist chewing on ribs. After you're done eating, they're just nothing like laying around and chewing on a rib, you know? It's, just, <laughs> it's the next best thing to go into Bill Miller's. Get it all over yourself. You know, if you found ribs and they've been chewed on, we'd say, well, okay, maybe it was coyotes. They've all been clipped off the back most well. We know large birds of prey like to clip off the wings and their ribs and all that stuff. In point of fact, when the carcass was found, there was a red-tailed hawk sitting on it. You think the red-tailed hawk killed this thing? No. You think we're ever going to figure out what killed this thing? No. What's the only conclusive way to figure out what killed this thing? Yeah, we would have had to have seen it happen. We don't know how many different critters have fed on this carcass by this point. No, no, can't help you with that. You need more help, there's a couple of extension publications that'll help you out. I just got done revising this one. It's an oldie but a goodie that was out of print for several years and it's just now back in the bookstore. Uh, this one's been out since 2004. Uh, that'll help you make those nasty decisions, you know, like cost-benefit ratios and all that good stuff. <sighs> Made it, Richard. All the way to the end. Let's give uh, Jim a...